Mayfield, possibly out of Cleveland. You want to be a boss? That's how you be a boss. Oh, welcome. It is a beautiful, it's 69 degrees here in Indianapolis after the show. I'm just going to go get my thong on and sit outside. I don't know what you guys are going to do and gals, but that's what I'm going to do. And I'll accept any pictures of anybody that wants to, you know, because that's how I do. But welcome, welcome, and more welcome. Uh, Look, a sad situation Alabama basketball, you're tired of it, I'm tired of it, but Nate Oates yesterday, the coach, he came out and he gave the reason slash excuse slash explanation of what the whole pat down thing is, and before we get to Nate Oates, I want to say, I don't think that we're piling on, I don't think that we're beating a dead horse here, there has been a murder And I feel like, at least for me, one of the things is the victim and the family of the victim aren't being considered here. And I don't think that's right. I've never thought that's right. I've told you on this show before, I always think of the victim. I always think beyond my nose is what I call it. So many people can't think out here Like, well, you know, Brandon Miller's great. It wasn't his fault. That's fine if you want to believe that. But where's the empathy to the victim? Here's Nate Oates. That situation's on me. We addressed as a team. As soon as I brought it up to them, they immediately understood how it could be interpreted. And we all felt awful about it. They explained to me that it's like when TSA checks you before you get on a plane. And now Brandon's cleared for takeoff. We as the adults in the room should have been more sensitive to how it could have been interpreted. And I, I dropped the ball, that's, that's it. I dropped the ball on it, we've addressed it. I can assure you it won't happen again. Yeah, and that's solid. I mean, let's be honest, that whole deal's solid. What else can you do? But I think he's full of crap, I'll tell you why. It all depends on when they addressed it. If they address it after the game, now you got to understand this. In the game, when it happened, Twitter exploded about it. So I assume somebody with the with the social media crew, which all of these teams have, they all have camera people, they all have social media crew. My good friend J.D. Campbell, the SID at Indiana, his son Chris is that for Ohio State football. I was just having a long conversation uh, with J.D. about the social media teams that teams have, that schools have, that programs have. So here's my problem and here's my question. I don't think any of these guys are smart enough to ask the question, but here's the question. All right, everybody felt terrible about it. However, after the game, Brandon Miller switched his profile picture to the pat down. Now, if they spoke on this right after the game, here's what happens after a game. You come in, you douse guys with water, you talk to your team, then you go do media, players do media, everybody then hangs out, whatever, takes a shower, and then the coach comes back in 99.9% of the time and talks to the team, gives the schedule, don't forget to go to class, that kind of thing. Well, I got to believe that between the time Nate Oates came in after the Arkansas game, did his media talk to whomever, and 30 minutes maybe transpires before you come back in. I got to believe in that 30 minutes that somebody from the social media team said, Coach, look at this. This is what transpired. We got to address this. All right? And this is what transpired you're seeing here. So here's the deal. If everybody felt so terrible about this, why did this kid, Brandon Miller, change his profile picture after the game to being patted down. See, that's where I have a huge problem with Brandon Miller, among others. That, to me, is like, are you sticking it to the family? Are you saying to the family, we're going to mock this? That's my problem. I don't care what you do with Alabama. and We all know Alabama, you know, the, the, the wide receiver, uh, Jermaine Burton hitting the girl. Alabama doesn't care about women. Alabama doesn't care about this. They want to win football and basketball games. That's their right. That's what they're doing. But you can't mock the victim. That's how I see it. Now, 
if somebody from Alabama says, you know what, we didn't talk about it until after we got the picture off and uh, what's his face, Brandon Miller, deleted it, fine. But I'm telling you, I just laid out for you, and nobody else has, and I don't understand it, because what I just laid out for you is exactly what should have transpired. So don't lie to me, NATOs. I mean, you can do whatever you want to me, but don't lie to us, NATOs, about everybody felt terrible. When did you tell Brandon Miller and the team? And if NATOs is smart, he's going to say, I told them the next day. And we got the picture off, and Brandon decided to delete his account, but I guarantee you they didn't, and this disturbs me. You don't mock murder victims. You don't mock the loss of life. I don't care how successful you are. I don't care how much money you're going to make or maybe you're making right now with the NIL. I don't care. You don't mock loss of life when certainly you don't do it when you are involved. Speaking of loss, Lori Lightfoot, the worst mayor in the United States, she has presided over, uh, well, let's look, monstrous, historic, all-time murder rates in her city. Let's hear from Lori Lightfoot as she concedes her loss yesterday. Let me just uh, do this. So thank you and and thank everyone so much. Um, I feel a lot of love in this room as I've felt every step of the way on this journey. Uh, I've called Brandon Johnson and Paul Vallis uh, to congratulate them on their victories in advancing uh, to the runoffs. We were fierce competitors in these last few months, um, but I will be rooting and praying for our next mayor to deliver uh, for the people of the city for years to come. Thank you. Well, I don't know if you know this, but of course, you know where Lori Lightfoot went. Lori Lightfoot went race and gender. Race and gender are what cost her the race. That's all anybody has anymore. You did a horrible job. You were hired. Think about this. It is impossible for a black gay woman to not have the job. It's just literally impossible. She gets her brains beat out in an election. It was 84 to like 14. But of course, she blames it on racism. I'm a black woman in America. Of course, if she was treated unfairly, that's what she said. Yeah. All right. I'm a black woman. Let's not forget certain folks, frankly, don't support us in leadership roles. Is that right? All right. Uh, when she was mayor, gun violence in 20 and 21 went from 500 murders to 776 to 804, shootings, carjacking, she ran as a diversity candidate. That's all she had. She had nothing else. And now she's crying as a diversity candidate that got beat. 40% spike in violent crime. Epidemic of gun violence devastates families, shatters communities, and she seemed to not care. She liked being the heavy during the pandemic. She shut down the lakefront. She told people to stay home. She was heavy-handed and ineffective. I don't give a damn if you're white, black, green, or purple. Her leadership was horrendous for the city. Paul Valis is a school chief. Uh, Brandon Johnson, Cook County Commissioner. I don't know if they're any better, but they can't. Well, you can always be worse. So she got her brains beat out. Speaking of brains beat out, last night, my beloved Indiana Hoosiers took it on the chin. I got to tell you, I'm watching. I didn't watch the start of the game. Boom, boom, boom. Bunch of threes. I sit down to finally watch. I'm like, oh, they're down nine. They'll come back. So I live bet it didn't go so good. Of course it didn't go so good. It was one of the few games that at home where you go, all right, Well, we can turn this off. They made a little run. They came back. But I got to tell you, I got to tell you, there was no sense that Indiana was going to win that game. Kudos to Iowa. Iowa was exceptional. They hit 13 threes on the road. I told you this was the most interesting mental game of the year. Iowa coming off a, what, 13-point deficit in the last minute and 20 seconds for a huge win at home against Michigan State. Indiana, 
a dramatic win at Purdue, I got to tell you, the more mentally tough team won. Indiana could not handle coming back from Purdue. Mike Woodson said as much, the coach of Indiana. I love what he does here. He addresses the media after the game. Here's Mike Woodson, IU head coach. Taking, whether it was in timeouts, you saw, half same, time. you saw the same game I did. They had their way doing everything they wanted to do. In a game like that where the other team's making that many threes, is it more about trying to defend them and stop them, or is it more about, hey, we got to make threes too? How do you approach that aspect of it? How about playing some defense? That'll help, which was... Uh, a little blogger boy named Jeff Rabjohns asked an incredibly stupid question. You know I dislike the media, but I do understand you're trying to get Woodson to talk. But let me ask you, well, are you trying to match him threes or are you trying to play defense? Hey, hey, Lee, they just hit a three. Hey, you go down and hit a one-two, please. It is completely, totally idiotic. But that's the Indianapolis, Indiana blogger boy media. I love that Mike Woodson shut the thing down. It actually continued for a couple minutes just like that. You get the point. I love that the Indiana coach is like that now. I know Mike Woodson. I don't know him great. I've been hard on Mike Woodson because I think he, initially he wasn't coaching to like Indiana should be coached. Now he is. They've been terrific. They got their brains beat out. The world will still be okay. They've got a talented team going into the NCAA tournament. But damn it, I want my Indiana coach. I want my Indiana coach to be a bad mother. And we're going to play a video at the end of the show about Bob Knight after a win and how he treated Steve Alford back in the day. I want the old days. The new days of being soft on players, let other teams have that. But at Indiana, where we choke you out if we can't get you to play the way we want, where we get blanked off, where we yell and scream, I want my coach doing that thing right there, looking at a reporter and going, how about playing some defense? I love it. I know you do too. I know the real Indiana fans absolutely love it. But look, ladies and gentlemen, you got to give. You got to give credit where credit is due. And you got to give it to Iowa and crazy friend McCaffrey. He got his team ready after a big win. The psychology of basketball, you ready for it? Here it is. The team you had yesterday is not the team you have today and won't be the team you have tomorrow. Bill Parcells. And Stu, uh, bah, 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 Lou Holtz both told me that. Actually, I'd forgotten that Holtz had said that as well. That is so true. The team he had yesterday in college basketball, hey, man, it changes. Girl may break up. Uh, girl may like a guy. I don't know. But the team you had yesterday, bad grade on a test. Something happens in the family. All these things happen in college. And I'm telling you, you saw it. Hawkeyes ready to go. Hoosiers had no juice, no nothing. Zero. Zip. Nada. Corey Simon is going to join us. Uh, Corey Simon, All-American, sixth pick in the draft. Those of you that remember him in 06 with the Colts, uh, terrific, terrific man. Now he is a uh, United States senator. He is a guy, uh, he's a Florida state senator, excuse me. He is a guy, a rising star in politics, but Corey Simon, uh, I'm looking forward to talking to him because, well, Deion Sanders made some comments about how he recruits. He wants people who came from nothing, quoting Deion Sanders. And Corey Simon, look, Corey Simon came from a single parent home, and I don't think Corey Simon feels as if he came from nothing. 
I mean, this is a dude that not only uh, made himself into a national champion at Florida State, the sixth pick in the NFL draft, a nine-year career in the NFL, and is now a senator. You know, I always take offense. I don't take offense to much. You guys know this. But I, I, I always wonder, are guys just talking? Uh, Senator Corey Simon, thank you for your time, sir. Um, I was just detailing your background. You know, single mother. Uh, she worked hard. I'm listening to Deion Sanders. And I'm going to ask you this before we even start. Do you think Deion Sanders, who is a Florida State guy, seemingly a, a great guy, I don't know, you think he's just talking? Or did, did, did he, was he trying to make a point that is actually in his mind, nobody else made in his mind valid? You know what? I, I think it's one, yes, I, I do think Deion is, is talking. Um, he, does a, he does a terrific job at, at promoting his program. Um, getting families to buy in. I think he's a wonderful coach. I think he's a great person. Um, I think what he said out loud is is being said in in you know boardrooms across the country in terms of the NFL uh, and maybe even in that college uh, those college boardrooms. So you know it, it's unfortunate. Um, you know I think uh, most young people when they're going into college um, that that succeed at a high level succeed for one of two reasons. Um, one, they're running from something or they're running to something. Um, and I think, you know, him kind of painting that picture. Yeah. There's some hot takes there. There are things that we're going to talk about this morning. Uh, but you know, it's, I don't think it's anything new. It's, it's, it's unfortunately a part of the game. Uh, I'd say. Which part do you say is, is part of the game slash said in the back rooms of the NFL, which part in particular to you? You know, they're all looking for a leg up. They're, they're looking for uh, that next great player, right? And so, you know, we're going to see it as it comes down to draft time this year. You know, they're trying to parse every possible thing they can to separate a player on the field, right? They all want that high, you know, Pro Bowl caliber, all pro, perennial all pro player in their program, right? And so they're going to use whatever metric, dynamic, whatever they can um, to try and make sure that they're not, they're not going to get a bus situation, uh, you know, one, two years down the road, say, Hey, we picked the wrong guy. So it is, it's something that's being used. I, I don't think that there's a whole lot of scientific data behind it, but you know what, who knows? Uh, maybe somebody is, is spent a lot of time and energy and money uh, to invest in seeing what that looks like. Uh, you know, he talks about defensive linemen. Listen, I was a defensive lineman. My mother worked extraordinarily hard, worked for public supermarket for over 35 years. Uh, I had everything that I needed and even some of the things that I wanted. Um, and, and, but my ability to thrive on the field was based on what I was willing to do to count the cost to go out there and play it at a high level. Um, I, I don't know if that had anything to do with my background in terms of what I had and what I didn't have. Uh, what I do know is the work that I was willing to put in to get there and to stay there. Um, those are the things that got me there. So, you know, that it, it, I, I hate that it that it came out the way that it did. Um, but it's 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 something that they're going to all talk about. And he does a great job of that. You know, he gets coming, folks. Talking. Coming from nothing like you can live in a big house, you can have cars, but sometimes you come from nothing internally there. I. I don't know. You came, as you said, your mother worked at Publix. You, um, you didn't come from nothing, I assume. No, you're absolutely right. No, I, I, I think I had a great life. You know, I, I think most kids that grow up in, in struggling situations don't recognize a struggle um, for many of us because yeah. we're in the we're in the situation, right? We're just trying to, you know, to to make ends meet every single day, and so, um, you know, it, it's. It, it, it's disheartening the way I think it came out. Um, if if if, I, if Dion had it to say all over again, I'm not sure if he'd change it. But I, I think uh, there's enough to be said that there are some really talented quarterbacks that that come from um, meager beginnings uh, and go on to to be extraordinarily successful 
And uh, I, I just I don't like the tenor and tone of, of, of how that argument came out uh, or that statement came out, um, because I don't think uh, it really, truly defines a player. It's the work that they're trying to put in. It's the God given talent that they were given. Uh, and then are they willing to count the cost to be great? Uh, and I don't know if 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 that has a whole lot to do with uh, with how they were raised. You know, one of the. One of the things you just said is so true, and you do not even know it until you get older and look back, is that if you, like, we weren't rich at all. I mean, but you look back and you're like, huh, yeah, I couldn't get that. Yeah, I, I, we didn't eat out. We, we never could eat. You know, and you don't realize it at the time. You're exactly right. You don't realize it. And then you get older and you're like, oh, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's just kind of the nature of it. You know, it, it's not until you get older and you realize, Hey man, I, Hey, we, we didn't do some of these things that, that some of my other <laughs> friends or teammates had or the experiences they had. And, and you know what, I'm, I'm, I'm better for it. Um, we're here now, right? It, it's, it's, it's not where you're from. It's where you're going. And, and, uh, and, you know, once you get there, uh, it's about the journey. Um, you're a senator, state of Florida, backed by Ron DeSantis. I got to ask you, what is going on in your mind between Walt Disney World and Ron DeSantis? Well, I, I think I, I think that's pretty much a done deal, right? It was uh, Walt Disney World had um, they had secured a deal back in 1967. Uh, that the state of Florida basically signed over the farm, signed the farm over to them to allow them to uh, build this great place that we now know and love. Um, over the years and, and, you know, having a board based out of California, uh, they've sub subscribed to some things that here in the state of Florida uh, aren't very popular. And as, especially as it applies to our children and what's going on and what's being taught in our schools and this intersectionality and all of this other stuff that's going on, um, it, it doesn't sit right with Florida values. And so we thought, uh, the governor thought, I think that, you know, by the, the, you know, the bill that we signed a few weeks ago, um, we thought that Florida should, should know best what's best for Florida. And so that's why we did what we did. Uh, that's why the actions that the governor taught, uh, brought were appropriate. Um, it's about making sure uh, that they don't, that California doesn't muck up Florida. And what we've done here in this great state, uh, the freedoms that all of our residents enjoy, uh, the things that we fight for, uh, and the values that are coming out of California, un unfortunately, don't align. Uh, and so with Disney being based here in the great state of Florida, um, we felt like Florida needed a seat at the table and it hadn't had that. And so uh, we're thankful for that legislation. I, I love what you did. Um, I, see, I don't think just because you're running for something or you own something that you have to acquiesce. You did not acquiesce. You canceled debates uh, because the people that were setting up the debates in your mind weren't on the up and up. I, Corey, I got to tell you, man, I, I, when I was looking into you, I, I thought this was one of the great things. So many times, you know, politicians get beholden to put on a happy face and deal with crap, to tell you the truth. I applaud you for that. Can you walk people through that? Um, I, I think the debate you're talking about, it was, it was being put on by a, uh, a partisan group disguised as a nonpartisan organization. Um, and, and we knew that, right? It, it wasn't, it wasn't a surprise. Um, we understood that this was a gotcha situation that was really catered to my opponent's base. Uh, it really wasn't, uh, a, uh, a discussion that was going to be, um, down the middle and allow us to, to talk about the ideas and policies and things that, uh, I think, uh, affect the, the great voters of, of district three. And, and so we made the call to, uh, put the information out there. We went straight to the to the media source. Um, you know, those are you know, it, it's unfortunately, uh, you know, a lot of our folks get caught up in the mix of a narrative, and uh, you know, it's our job to counter that narrative with with truth and facts. And so that's what we did. Uh, it all worked out. Um, I'm moving forward. My opponent is moving forward, and. Uh, and I think the, the good people here in District 3 will benefit from my, uh, from my presence in the Senate.
Corey, what made you want to get into politics? You know, for me, it wasn't something that uh, that I actually really wanted to do. Uh, this is something that was spoke over my life back in 2004. I was still playing at the time. I was in Philadelphia and a good friend of mine, he was my pastor, called me up and he wanted to sit down and talk with me. And I sat down with him and and he proceeds to tell me, God's calling you to politics. <laughs> and I laughed at him. I said, I, I don't have an interest right. in politics. Um, I, I really just, you know, I, I enjoyed serving in community. Um, I enjoyed being a part of the fabric of this great community, but I really wasn't interested in politics. And then from 2004, a good friend of mine, former NFL player Peter Bolwer, uh, runs for a house seat in this area. Um, and he comes up a little bit short, but I got a chance to help him on his campaign and, and spend some time with him. And he told me at the end, he says, Corey, you should be doing this. Uh, and at that point in 2008, I still wasn't interested in, in, in politics, but I was interested in people. And so it's kind of been this slow pull um, into this political arena uh, over the last you know, 15 years or so, excuse me, the last 15 years or so that has gotten me to this point. And, um, you know, uh, the governor called me into his office at the time I was the CEO of Volunteer Florida running a state agency. And the governor called me into his office and he he said, Corey, I, I really want you to consider running for this Senate seat. Now, this same Senate seat, I I, I told the governor uh, two years ago, no, because my son was a senior in high school and, and I wanted to see him through the finish line. And I didn't want to be out campaigning and, and all of those things uh, with him still being in school. And when I came home after I had that discussion with the governor and uh, my wife said, you know, you've got to stop running from this. There's a calling on your life to serve people at a higher level. Uh, and so you need to you need to do this. And and after some prayer and some time and, um, you know, just kind of soul searching, uh, I decided to jump in this thing. And, and I will tell you, it, it's outside of all the noise that happens around campaigns. I, I will say that. Um, my experience campaigning, my experience getting out in the community and talking with folks, even folks that don't agree with me politically, um, was one that was extraordinarily beneficial. Uh, I don't have a negative thing to say about the political process in terms of how it, uh, how I embraced it. Um, and, and I'm excited to be here doing this. I mean, this is the first time that um, that this district has, has been a Republican district uh, since Reconstruction. Um, and so we've got some we've got we've got an opportunity to do some special things for the good working, hardworking people uh, of this district. I've got a lot of farmers. I've got a lot of aquaculture folks here in this district. I've got a lot of state workers. And so it covers the whole gamut uh, of concerns and issues that are present. And I'm excited to be able to represent them um, in the state Senate. Corey, let's break some news here. All right. Let's break some news. DeSantis is going to take on Trump in 2024. Come on, let's break some news. <laughs> I think that uh, you're asking the wrong person for that one. I, you know, I uh, I think the governor will make uh, whatever decision he decides to make in, in due time. Um, meanwhile, we've got uh, 22 million people, almost 23, 23 million people here in the great state of Florida uh, to serve. And I think he's doing that at a high level. And and uh, and that's where my focus is. I think that's where his focus is right now. Um, you know, that's that's what we'll, we'll worry about that when that comes. Uh, but right now, uh, there's far too much work. There's almost a thousand people a day that are moving into this state of ours. Uh, and we've got to find a way to make sure that they're employed, uh, make sure that they have homes, they have food on the table. Uh, and so those are the things that we're going to focus on. I'll let the governor make that announcement whenever that, well, whenever or and if ever that announcement comes out. That was a great political answer right there. That was, that was <laughs> tremendous. All right. We're going to break other news. You played with Peyton Manning. I live in Indy. I've covered Peyton and I, I you know, with the Colts in the media for years. Love all of them, but let's be honest. Let's break it right now. Peyton Manning was incredibly overrated. Come on, let's go. I want to get this into the New York Post. Manning overrated. Come on. Uh, uh, listen, <laughs> there are things that I can say about Peyton and, and I love him, but saying he's overrated would be the, uh, that, that would be <laughs> a far right. stretch. That he he get, he deserves everything that he gets. His talent, uh, not only on the field, but what he does, uh, he's just he's he's just he's fun to watch because he's hilarious. I, I mean, that has made yeah. Monday Night Football. He and Eli that has made Monday Night Football bearable in many weeks. So um, I'm excited for him. I really am. Uh, he was a great teammate, an exceptional quarterback, one of the top five to ever do it. Um, 
you know, if we'd, we'd played a little bit more defense over the years, I think uh, you know, had a few more Super Bowl rings. Yeah, that's a good answer. I love him, too, the hospital that, you know, that he has here, Peyton Manning's hospital. I just thought maybe we'd break some news. You know, Senator Corey <laughs> Simon says Manning overrated Brady, number one. You know, what the hell? I, I had to take, <laughs> uh, no, had we, to we take weren't. a swing. Listen, I'm, I'm not going to get on here and start lying to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's fair. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> that's fair enough. Hey, uh, thanks for the time. I know you know you're swamped. I know you're busy. I know a lot of things going on. Hey, last last thing. Uh, I coached for a number of years uh, college basketball. Always admired Coach Bowden. Give me your take on on Coach Bowden. Just a tremendous man of faith, an icon in the sport. Um, the reason I'm doing what I'm doing today is because of what that man birthed in me, the leadership, um, the accountability, the passion and love for family, uh, love for God. Listen, I, I tell folks all the time, the folks that you, the, the thing that you saw about Coach Bowden on the screen is actually who he was. There was no making it up and, and playing to the cameras. He, he, there was none of that. Uh, Coach Bowden was the most genuine man I've ever met. Uh, he became a father to so many of us that came through this program. Um, I miss him dearly. He was my neighbor. He used to live right around the corner from me. Um, and any day I could walk up to his door. You don't even have to ring the doorbell. Half the time he didn't even lock the door. Uh, just walk in and sit down and talk to him about life. Most of my conversations were never about football. Um, it was just about uh, learning to be a man and appreciating humanity and um, that's what he cared most about. And so he will be missed terribly. Um, he is an icon in, in, the, in, the, in the sports world, uh, the greatest coach, in my opinion, to ever do it. Yeah, I've always, I'm, 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 I'm glad to hear you say that with such conviction. You know, I mean, I, we can all talk about our coaches in, in a way that says things, but I can tell the conviction uh, in your in your speech that you know what this this is a truly a special or was truly a special relationship with you and uh, and coach Corey it's been my honor to talk to you man I can't can't wait to see how you do and the whole deal it's it's just been an honor thank you thank you for having me Dan I appreciate it enjoyed it no, that's that's my pleasure that's Corey Simon um, I'm tell you right now I mean I don't want to get ahead but that dude's gonna be uh, President of the United States, I, I don't know. I just like people that are real and people that are deep and people that give some thought to what they're all about. And Corey Simon, uh, I followed him. I, I, I was a Florida State football fan, true story. I love Florida State football. Now, I'm about Dion's age, so uh, maybe I'm a little older. Maybe we're the same. I don't know. But I always followed him. When he came to the Colts and when he played, I, I followed. I followed Bolware. I followed Peter Warwick. I followed all those guys. In fact, I tried to recruit, recruit Peter Warwick to play basketball uh, at Indiana. We've got a monster for you today. Uh, we'll recap a crazy night in a bunch of different places. Let me see here. Mark Emmert's last day, he is out as the commissioner. You will not believe what the next guy, the next commissioner is going to do, and it'll blank you off uh, if you care about such things. Uh, we're going to talk What the Hell Wednesday. Trey Wallace going to give us the latest from Alabama. We'll be right back. Yeah, man, thanks for coming on. And so much to talk about. And I, I kind of just want to dive right in as, as somebody that I watch your show. And these are conversations that you have had uh, in the past couple of months. And, you know, NIL is, is such a game changer when it comes to different aspects of college sports. And we're starting to see that influx when it comes to boosters, people around the program, uh, how schools are navigating would it, you know, before we get into like the, the inner wellings of it, what's been your thoughts on how this has played out over the last two years? Uh, it's an implosion waiting to happen. Kind of what I said a few years before it started. I came on my, I came on someone, I think I was on McAfee when I said uh, about three years ago, I'm like, listen, the NIL should not be conducted this way it should not be formatted this way it should not be constructed this way or created this way and they're like what do you mean and i'm like it's going to end up imploding college football and it will be the end of 
junior college. It'll be the end of high school recruiting. It'll be the end of a lot of this stuff compact uh, compiled with transfer portal. So I say you can put these two things together. You're going to you're going to kill JUCO, which three years later, right now to this day, we just had our second California JUCO fold. Uh, Kansas JUCOs are not doing well like at all. Mississippi is not doing well at all. Resource wise, you're not going to have the resources you once have. You've already seen the entire state of Arizona lose junior college football. So like you're having this impact, that influx that people don't realize that has a direct impact uh, just from the correlation of these things. And people don't really look into it deep because they just want to see what's on the surface. They don't, they only look through the optical lens of things. They don't really dive into anything. And it, it, it blows my mind that we're in this analytical world and we don't look into the data and the analytics. We just want to talk, talk, talk on Twitter because all people on Twitter know all things, right? So yeah. when I'm sitting there talking and I'm sitting there looking into it and I'm like, well, look, what they should have did was, by the way, good friend of mine growing up with Ed O'Bannon, he's the one that started this whole thing with the NCAA NIL deal. We played high school basketball together and, a whole, and Charles and Ed, and, and uh, he started this thing. And it's crazy, right? It's a slap in the face. NCAA, we already know what that stands for, non-caring assholes of America. They yeah. basically pay everybody like $11, right? 100,000 people get paid like $11. Oh, we won. We didn't really win. You created this NIL deal, which basically is – for the one percenters, Trey, one percenters. Yeah. Think about it. Everyone thinks on the outside looking in that these kids are getting millions. No, one percent, if that, I would actually say 0.001% is actually getting the millions. The rest of the percentage, the 99.9% .9 of the kids are average NIL dollar. I don't know if you know what it is, but it's $300. Guy asked me, Indiana game last night, Barry Ferguson asked me, how do you coach a game like that? Indiana got absolutely boot stomped, 13 threes by the Iowa Hawkeyes. Here's a simple, hey, you line up your kids and you're like, fellas, get in here. All right, short speech, get in the shower, get dressed, and get out of here before Iowa comes down here and kicks our backside again. And then you go. You want, and you make fun of them, right? You're like, hey, man, they beat you so bad, you better get out of here because that neighborhood bully is coming down. You know what? We've all been there. I told you the other day, when Iowa beat Michigan State, coaches, on, we've all been on both sides. I told you, a minute three to go, down 13. We took the lead. They hit a half-court shot uh, against Kent State, down 24, 10 minutes to go on the road at Kent. We won the game. So we've all been there, but last night was an absolute you-know-what kicking. Get dressed, fellas, and get the hell out of here. That's it. Uh, we got a new president of the NCAA, Mark Emmerich, who is no favorite of really anybody. He's a snooty little uh, whiny little. He actually did this. At the Final Four in, I believe, New Orleans, a friend of mine was a higher-ranking guy in the NCAA, and Emirat and his wife found out that my buddy had a better suite than theirs, and he demanded that they change so that he could get a better suite. The dude was insane with that kind of crap. I don't think Stuart Mandel, noted writer of college football, has a lot of respect for the achievement of this man <laughs> Here, Mark Emmert. Let's show Mandel's Twitter. Today is Mark Emmert's last day. Let's take a moment uh, to highlight the accomplishments. That's pretty funny. That's really funny. And that, to me, is like, I don't know. You know, my initial reaction is, all right. All right. 
I mean, I get it, right? We all get it. But that is pretty funny. I ain't mad about it. You know, the new guy is a man named Charlie Baker. He's out of Boston. He's not moving here. So he's not moving to Indianapolis. Good for Charlie Baker. He's showing us. Yeah, he is. Charlie Baker said, yeah, I'm going to stay out here in Boston. uh, And I'm not moving there. Well, I got to tell you, um, it's interesting to me because... I've owned, my family has owned a business, a sporting goods business, and we learned one thing. If you ain't at the business, it ain't run the same way. It ain't going to be, you know what I'm saying? People might be taking things. People might be too comfortable to actually work. Customers may be lost. So old Charlie Baker, now he's the governor of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. He's the next president. He played uh, at Harvard. He is credited with bringing bipartisan uh, leadership to the great state of Massachusetts. Awesome. Good for Charlie Baker. But he ain't moving here. He's saying, I am not doing it. All right. Uh, We, a lot of us saw the beating of a teacher. And I got to tell you, it is disturbing. And every time I see these things, you're going to see it right here. Uh, I don't understand. Look at this. This person isn't helping these people. This guy isn't even running. This lady is running, but look at a security guard. He's just walking over here. He's just walking over. I mean, what are you doing? Like, what are you people doing? I, I want to know something. And I think Jennifer and all of you on the YouTube chat will agree. I, we're so tired of seeing like, um, people get beat. Like, we're so tired of seeing, well, I got my camera phone here. Uh, How about you help? How about you help somebody? How about you, I I don't know. I mean, how about you absolutely, like, instead of taking a camera, instead of some idiot security guard just walking over, how about we, oh, I don't know, help the dude out, help the lady out, help somebody out. So now he is, uh, he's going to be, you know, and, and here's what this happened. This teacher took the Nintendo Switch, which I don't even know what it is. I assume, I know Nintendo, all right? But the Switch is like something that you use. And so he took it, or she took it, because she wanted the, the student to actually, like, learn and not have a Nintendo Switch. And... People are saying, well, you know, should never have taken the Nintendo Switch. What are you, an idiot? What What? what are you, an idiot? Uh, the lady is saying, yeah, I didn't take his Nintendo Switch. I didn't do that. So the guy, the assailant, was 270 pounds, stomped 15 times uh, the teacher, Nyditch, says, I want to set the record straight. I didn't take a Nintendo Switch. For anyone that's read or heard differently, I've been told that is unfortunately misinformation. Brendan Depot told cops he launched his tirade because after she took his handheld game council. 6'6", 270. He sprints, he knocks her over. It took four adults. The lady was rushed to a hospital. Told cops he was going to kill her. All right. He's going to be tried as an adult for aggravated battery on a school board employee. 30 years in jail. Kid had a violent past. Arrested three times for simple battery. Now, he's considered disabledly disabled and requires special design instruction. Yeah? All right. I don't know what to tell you. Um, Let's check out America's apparent... Uh, dependent, right? I mean, Zelensky, Ukraine, he's become a dependent. Your money and my money is being sent hand over fist to not only fund a war, but it's being sent hand over fist, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to provide a lifestyle as well. This is the first year I have not wanted to pay taxes. This is the first year I've said, screw this. Let's hear from Zelensky. 
the U.S. will have to send their sons and daughters exactly the same way as we are sending their sons and daughters to war, and they will have to fight because it's uh, nature that we're talking about, and they will be dying, God forbid, because it's a horrible thing. So Zelensky is saying that if the United States doesn't intervene financially, we're going to have to send our kids to fight wars. Donald Trump basically told Zelensky when he was president, hey, look, you and Putin, get your stuff straightened out. There have been all kinds of politicians, all kinds of folks that have said there's nobody more corrupt than the Ukraine government. Let's play that again from the start, if you don't mind. I I didn't hear the beginning. The U.S. will have to send their sons and daughters exactly the same way as we are sending their sons and daughters to war, and they will have to fight because it's uh, nature that we're talking about, and they will be dying, God forbid, because it's a horrible thing. So a guy who's supposedly running a war has time to go to award show. He's speaking on everything. I, I hope he's not right. I, I hope he's not accurate. I don't know, but there isn't a thing I would trust out of that guy's mouth. I like what Trump said. Hey, you two, figure it out. Figure it out. You know what I mean? It just is. Figure it out. So at the end of the day, we all are paying this man for his war and his pensions because we have to have war when we have liberals in the White House. We have to have racial discord when we have liberals in power. It's what keeps them in power. We need them. I want less government. I don't want a dime sent to the Ukraine. And frankly, Michelle Obama, why in a Inflation Reduction Act is there a million dollars to a bike trail? If you had any heart, any soul, any sense of the American people, you would demand that that was cut out. We don't need to be taxed for your uh, walking trail. I'm sorry, for your walking trail. It's insane to me. All right, last night, college basketball, I talked about Indiana, and I talked about how the Indiana-Iowa game was the most difficult game. It was. It was the most difficult mental game that there is. But I'll tell you, Kansas playing at home last night, I man, they were in a dogfight with a Texas Tech team that, frankly, has been beat by injury. Keep your eye on Kansas as we move towards the NCAA tournament. I'll tell you why. I think Kansas can lose early. I don't think this is an overpowering team. I also think Kansas can win the national championship. Now, you're going to tell me, well, of course some teams can lose early. And, of course, teams can win the national championship. I don't think I don't think uh, Houston can lose early. I don't think UCLA can lose early. I I think they can both win national championships, but I don't see them losing early. I have no idea what's going to happen with Brandon Miller, but I don't see what I've seen out of Alabama. I don't see them losing early. I think Purdue could because I think their young guards are banged up. I think their young guards are tired and frankly, they're young guards, but I don't, I, I can see Kansas sitting there at number three being the kind of team that you're like, huh, but they can sure go on a run, but they can sure look mediocre too. They really can. And I'm watching last night. I caught the end of the game last five minutes. They showed mental toughness, but they've always showed mental toughness inside of Rock Chalk Jayhawk. Fog Allen. Virginia did what you kind of figured Virginia would do, bounce back. Clemson started out great, and now they're reeling a bit as they've gone through the middle now to the end of the ACC tournament. Duke just – I just don't buy Duke. I think North Carolina State came into Duke, tough game. Cameron Indoor, you're not winning. But uh, you know what? Duke did what they needed to do. They got to win. And bad news for Tennessee. It was as solid an effort last night for Tennessee as they have had in a long, long time. But the bad news is their point guard, Ziegler, a sophomore – Man, oh man, I love watching that kid play. He's about 5'9". He's the heart and soul. He's from New York City. He's a Kai Ziegler. Um, He banged up his knee, and it did not look good. He could not put weight on it. The question that I have, and I've not seen this out of anybody, is did it pop? We all know, at least if you've been around enough, when it straightens out, 
stiff-legged pop, that's an ACL. I'm not even going to speculate. I don't know. But in talking to Dylan, who pays attention way more than I do to Tennessee, he's like, man, this dude's the heart and soul of the team. And now that kid being out is not a great deal. In fact, it's a horrible deal for Tennessee. One of the things that you have to do uh, as you get ready for tourney week and the NCAA tournament is you got to stay healthy. You're playing Thursday, Saturday, Friday, Sunday. You know, if you get in in the first four, you're playing Tuesday, Thursday, or Tuesday, uh, Friday, Sunday. I mean, it's crazy. So you got to have your guys. And uh, sad news. Uh, let's go ahead, Ryan and Dylan. My Hoosiers, as we've talked about, got absolutely just kicked. I mean, there was no chance Indiana was coming back against Iowa. I give Iowa great credit, man. Iowa had this big win against Michigan State, and what they do? Oh, I don't know. They just decided to come back and play the breaks off of Indiana. Let's show Mike Woodson being an Indiana coach. I love what Mike Woodson did in the post game after the game. He's the head coach of Indiana. You're not supposed to clap and be happy because you got beat. This is Woody after the game. Mike, uh, you know, what's, what's the message to your team in the, in the wake of that when, you know, very little went right for you tonight? Not real happy. You know, I mean, we just, we left our game in West Lafayette, you know, and it's just unacceptable the way we played tonight. You know, I apologize to our fans. You know, I'm the coach. I got to get them ready to play. And that was a bullshit performance tonight. Yeah. I guess from an adjustments perspective, just what wasn't taking, whether it was in timeouts, halftime. You saw the same game I did. They had their way doing everything they wanted to do. Jim? In a game like that where the other team's making that many threes, is it more about trying to defend them and stop them, or is it more about, hey, we got to make threes too? How do you approach that aspect of it? How about playing some defense? That I That's glorious. I mean, a little blogger boy, like, I get it. Everybody wants to ask a question because then you hope something happens. You go viral. I get the world we live in, particularly on this website called Pigs. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, uh, I don't know what to tell you, man. Well, look, you made a three. Hey, come on down and jack up a three. We got to match them. It's the dumbest question. Look, Lee is like, hey, can you give guys in the media a break, right? Lee's my wife. Can you give guys in the media a break? I'm like, no, that's a stupid question by a stupid guy. Uh, so there you go. No, they don't get the benefit of the doubt. John Edward Kruger says, Dan hating on Duke while Indiana – got blown out. Uh, what does one have to do with the other? I ask. I, I don't know. Maybe they do, but I'm not hating on Duke. I just said that I don't believe in Shire and Mike Trogge. I don't. You may. I do not. Mike Trogge joins me and others in exclusive company. You know what it is? Dickie V tweeted it out last night, but it's uh, first year head coach undefeated at home. Shraggy's the or uh, Shire's the first one. Samson did it at Indiana. I did it. I think I was only two and zero. Oh. I think it was Ohio State and and Minnesota, but still undefeated my first year as a head coach. Tommy Lloyd did it at Arizona last year. Don't at me, people. Do not at me. No, I'm the only head coach in Indiana basketball history that went undefeated at home for his entire career. So if you're going to at someone, figure it out. At somebody, just not me. There you go. Uh, I do. St- I, got, I got a little bit of hell yesterday because I said Florida Atlantic at 26-3 and three should be in the NCAA tournament. Well, I got to tell you, I don't care. Well, you know, Dad, they're scheduled. And everybody gets to be Joe Lenardi. I'm not Joe Lenardi. I just know how tough it is to win in the NCAA men's college basketball division one leagues. I don't care what league it is. When you go 26 and three, you deserve to be in the tournament, whether or not you win your conference tournament. I'm just telling you, that is my opinion. Oral Roberts deserves to be in the NCAA tournament. Why? Why? Because Oral Roberts is the only Division I 
men's basketball team that finished their conference season undefeated in conference. I want you to think about that. Think about that just for a second. Road games, home games, traveling, everything like that. I got to tell you, in my world, I put them in. In nobody else's world do we put them in. All right, let's give you an update. Last night we talked about Antoine Davis. Antoine Davis, son of Mike Davis. Uh, A lot of Indiana fans, and I saw the letters, couldn't believe how freaking racist you all were to Mike Davis when he was there. But Antoine Davis is his son. A lot of Indiana people remember uh, Coach Davis walking off with his son over his neck. Let's give you an update. Last night, started the conference tournament in the horizon. We had, listen to this, 63 points is what Davis needs to break Pistol Pete's all-time NCAA scoring record from 1970. Now, I'm no mathematician, but 70 to get to 2000 is 30, 23 more years. That's 53-year record. Dang! So here's what he did. He had 38. They won 81-68. He needs 26 more points, so he needs 64 total, to break Pistol Pete's record. Now, Hey, he's going to aim high and let her fly. The dude went 14 of 27, eight rebounds, eight assists, four steals. They needed a win. They got the win. And now he go gets basically his average over the last five games, which is 29. And he will be the new NCAA scoring champion. And I love it. Not champion, all-time leader. And I love it. I'm a fan of Mike Davis. Here's why. Mike Davis handled everything at Indiana during and post with complete class. Mike Davis stood tall. Yes, it didn't go great for Mike Davis. In fact, I got to get Mike Davis on our show. Um, In fact, let's, let's try to do that. I'll try to get his number. I may have it. But anyway, Mike Davis is a guy that I have total respect for. Tough situation at Indiana. He, Dane Fife, Jared Jeffries, handled it beautifully. Next thing you know, Indiana is in the national championship game. Next thing you know, fast forward as a great father, Mike Davis, his son Antoine, is going to be the NCAA all-time leading scorer. It's a pretty good story if you really think about it. No, it's a great story. So I say salute Mike Davis. Salute. Uh, Let me do this right. Salute Antoine Davis. Salute Mrs. Davis. I don't know her name. And salute to the coach, Mike Davis. Here's hoping that Antoine drops 27 and everything goes the way that it should. The kid's put in a lot of work. The kid's done well. And I'm happy about it. All right, I got the craziest 21 seconds in maybe the history of basketball. Elon Musk just jumped up his net worth. Uh, Joe Biden is an idiot. All of that uh, on What the Hell Wednesday Coming up next, and you will not believe this story out of Turkey about some creature that survived in rubble for 21 days. We'll be right back. Welcome into Outkick the Show. I am Clay Travis, your fearless leader. I am going to continue to argue that sports is one of the great unifying forces in all of American life. ESPN is a sinking ship. Democrats are now the party of the white, woke college graduate. So the higher that number can be, the better you are with the committee. It's really that simple. You gotta lean into the turns. You really got to lean into the turns. He's got incredible taste in uh, <laughs> in which media figures he listens to. Very difficult to go back-to-back years in the NFL with the number one overall pick. I've been out of L.A. long enough to have forgotten that libs, no matter how ridiculous the scenario, are going to live. Another week of inflation, another week with Biden with COVID, and another set of losers to crown. People don't watch the WNBA on TV, in person, on a plane, on a train, on a bus, or on purpose. The scary thing, Tommy, is in the history of this government, I've never seen them give anything back that they've taken. Oh, no, they never do. And they won't. Why are we going through Melania's goods? Don't make Brittany Griner out to be some type freedom fighter. Shouldn't there be a little bit of common sense 
Let's roll them, big boy. What do you got? They want to find someone to be the face of domestic terrorism, and they want it to be a right-wing Trump supporter. Don't let them entrap you into doing something dumb. But they were hyper-rational. They looked at the data, and they said, it makes no sense for me to submit to this COVID shot yeah. mandate. Get the yeah. shot or you can't go to your brother's wedding. Get the shot or you can't go to your daughter's graduation. Get the shot or else. You know, one of the weird things about Twitter and Facebook and all the social media is sometimes people might get ahead of themselves, but sometimes maybe getting ahead of yourself predicts the future. Brandon Marshall, former wide receiver, well, he congratulated Aaron Rodgers on his retirement. I'm not sure Aaron Rodgers is retired. Let's have a listen. So I want to be the first to say, Salute to Aaron Rodgers for a phenomenal career. You're one of the greatest. You, person, me personally, you're my favorite quarterback ever. Favorite. Aaron Rodgers. Congratulations on a phenomenal career. You won a Super Bowl. Hell, I didn't have, I've never even made it to the playoffs. You should be proud, bro. Your name and your team, that team, forever sketched in the history of the NFL. Your kids, 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 kids is going to be able to see that. You want back-to-back MVPs. I think you won three MVPs. You're phenomenal. It's okay to walk away, bro. There's nothing else left to prove. Go travel the world. Go explore. Go build your family. Man, advice from Brandon Marshall. Hey, maybe he knows something. I don't know. Maybe he does. You never know. Like I've said, social media, sometimes, you know, we can get ahead of everything. And next thing you know, hey, turns out to be true. I don't know, man. But good for Brandon Marshall. And I'm going to tell you something. Of all the people, and you can look this up, in the world to get advice from, he's in the bottom 10%. I'm just going to say he's in, he's in the bottom 10%. Uh, Dan, Aaron Rodgers waiting until the cheese had blank him off, and then he'll come to my Vikings. That may be, but there you go. All right, I guess he's retiring if you listen to Brandon Marshall. He, you know, we got it. He didn't delete it, so he may know something. All right, watch this. Craziest 20.9 seconds you're ever going to see. Four lead changes, two dramatic, one layup, and a shot that people will be talking about forever. And it all went down in the great state of Maine. That's right, I said it and I meant it. The great state of Maine. I'll call it the lobster state. Let's have a look. 20 seconds left. And they have to go into the big men here, you would think. To the corner, Campbell, that's three. Oh, he knocks and there it down! It is. Scott's nice. lead! The one thing you cannot do. 13 seconds left. Davies on the drive. Davies all the way. What a and time. George! And the foul! Oh, Doctor! Davies, the free throw. Got it! The lead is two. 8.8. Campbell. Still, it's Campbell. Campbell all the way, contested. Bouchard, it's in, and one! And one, but Elliot Bouchard may have just sent his Scots to the regional final! One shot. This is huge. To win it for the Bonnie Eagle Scots. And he's done it! 1.3 to go! Baseball pass, Davies! Has one, has a chance! Oh, it's good! You can Whoa! Doctor! Are you kidding me? Will Davies! They're gonna count it! Bonnie Eagle says it shouldn't have counted! 
We get to see it back. We have Baseball to see the replay. Pass. Will Davies with the catch. Oh. Oh, my goodness, but they don't get oh, that it's replay. in his hands. Willie D, they count it oh. for the game. Oh, my goodness gracious. That's good hoops right there, right? That's dudes that are balling. They're balling down the court. They're balling. I mean, they are playing hard. They are playing smart. And here's the other thing. They executed that pass that the kid caught to make the game-winning shot is no easy pass. I mean, if, if you've ever watched this pass, I mean, that's right on target. I'm telling you, you, you try to throw a base or a basketball, particularly under duress, nine times out of ten, your hand curves and the ball goes that way. But he must have kept his elbow or his wrist under his hand and snapped the pass and that kid made an unbelievable play. I get fired up. I do. I get fired up on freaking plays like that. I do. I think it's absolutely great. I, I mean, it's fantastic. What a play. What execution. And then the kid, you know, he took his time. He lifted up. He's running forward, so you got to put a little arc on it to soften the ball up. That's fantastic. I don't know what to tell you. I like this, but I wish that Elon Musk would change the algorithms or whatever you call it on Twitter. We're all bleeding here, people. We're bleeding here. I got to tell you, before Elon Musk changed it, we're about 130, 140,000. Listen to that, people a day watching the show on Twitter. And now because he changed it, man, every show, not just ours, uh, not just Outkick, but every show across the country is down. Uh, the YouTube chat is beautiful. But Elon Musk, ladies and gentlemen, good news for the great man. Listen to this. He is once again the richest person on the planet. Now, if I asked you how much is he worth, I don't know what you would say. Like, I don't know what I would say. 150 billion? 187.1 billion dollars. Now, I don't know what any of this means, what I'm gonna say here in a minute, right? I, I don't I don't know, all right? But what I do know, the dude is on the spectrum. Now, what does that mean? Like people always say, you know, he's on the spectrum. I don't know. I don't. I have no idea what that means. I have no idea. I want to have an idea, but I have no idea. But I was told that last night. You know what I mean? And I'm like, all right. Um, the spectrum's pretty good, at least for Elon Musk. Let me say it again. Let me get this to you. One hundred eighty-seven point one. Billion. Now, what's that point one? 100 million? I don't know. But I'll take it. Today, tomorrow, the next day. You know what I mean? It's unbelievable. Man. Jeez. It's crazy. Anyway, I'm here for it. Elon Musk, you the man. Hey, look, what would a day be? What would a day be without talking about the incompetence? No, I meant the greatness of Joe Biden. There would be no days unless we had Joe Biden doing things that we love. Jersey Joe Biden, who said he wanted to put a ski on the end of his name when he was in Poland. Jersey Joe Biden that said, I was raised in the black church. I went before school to the Catholic church, and then I walked over to the black church. Joe Biden, who said, blah, 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 blah. he always actually said that. He said that numerous times, right? Joe Biden, who said he was so down with the brothers that corn pop in him got along at the swimming pool where he was, quote, the only white guy that was a lifeguard. Joe Biden, who talked about his son dying in war when, in fact, he died years later which is sad to me. I, I don't like talking about Joe Biden, who will say anything on any given day. The other day he said, hey, look, I'm Jill Biden's husband. No, I'm being serious. 
That's what he said. So Joe Biden, Black History Month, has to say something stupid. We all know it's coming. All right, look me in the eye. Who's on the YouTube chat right now? Look me in the eye and tell me you don't know this is coming. You don't know something stupid is coming. It would not be total Black History Month if Jersey Joe, Jolton Joe, Sniffin' Joe, Pervy Joe didn't say something stupid. So let's hear from Jolton Joe, Sniffin' Joe Biden and Black History Month. I, I may be a white boy, but I'm not stupid. <laughs> I know where the power is. I know where the power You think I'm joking. I learned a long time ago about the... I may be a white boy, but I'm not stupid. I'm a white boy, and I am stupid. Hell, and most of the white boys I know are stupid. I mean, let's just get that out there so that we don't seem racist. This, I mean, look, I love the fact that Jersey Joe, Jolton Joe, Sniffin' Joe feels like he can say anything he wants and listen, oh, blah, 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 you're funny. And then he's like, oh, I'm not kidding. All right. The question that I have, and I would love this to be answered, and I don't know how we answer it. All right. I got who's on the YouTube chat. Maybe they can answer it. But here's my question. Why is sometimes, like, he's lucid and he can talk, and other times, blah, 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 blah. What is the, I would love to know the concoctions of medications. Hey, Joe, it's the end of Black History Month. You need the good meds today. Hey, Joe, it's the State of the Union speech. You need the good meds today. Ah, Joe, you're just going to Poughkeepsie. You don't need the good meds. And Joe gets up there and goes, blah, 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 blah. I'm not joking, man. What's the concoction of drugs that has to go in to Joe Biden to get him to stand up in front of people and have some kind of, I don't know, some kind of semblance of a brain? What is it? I would really be curious because... There are cocktails that people take. I mean, they're called cocktails because they're a mixture of drugs. You know what I mean? I I would be curious. Antidepressants, anti-mumble, anti-stupid, brain functioning. Hey, look, we got to snap his synapses to get him going here for a minute. Can we do that? Yeah, he needs to take this cocktail. You know what I mean? Uh, It would be fascinating. Yeah, it would be. It would be very fascinating to see what is the cocktail that, you know, take on a day. And I would throw Camilla in. I would. I, I would throw Camilla in. She's just, she's just historically giggling all the time. It is hilarious to me. It is. So what is the cocktail Biden-Harris 24 take on a daily basis to just get them through a day? Now, there's no audio on this, but you got to see this. We all know the horrific uh, tornado. I'm sorry. Can I start again? We all know the horrific earthquake in Turkey. Lives lost. Tragic. Horrible. There is a good story, though, that comes out of it. A horse was found, you're going to see it here, alive, surviving 21 days in the rubble. That's truly amazing. Look, it doesn't make what happened go away. It doesn't, life shattered, everything gone, you know, that kind of thing. But it makes you at least feel good that out of this horrific situation, A horse, a living, breathing animal, was found, rescued from rubble 21 days after the hurricane in Turkey. I got to tell you, man, that it may be the definition of what the hell, right? I mean, that may just be like Biden's saying that you go, what the hell is he talking about? What the hell is he saying? Like the initial video we showed you about the layups and the shot to win it, we'd go, what the hell? 
See, what the hell may it be taking over the F word in terms of how you can use it? Now, I'm not going to go into the variations of the F word. Like, holy would be one uh, thing that you would say. But what the hell is getting there? I think the F word is universal. Go into any locker room, go into any politician's office, have any conversation. The F word usually finds its way in. But I got to tell you, man, WTH, strong. I think most people would agree with that. WTH, very, very strong. Very strong. All right. Did you ever see (laughs) Goodfellas? Did you ever see where Ray Liotta's girlfriend or assistant or friend, you know, is the smuggler, she's the mule? Uh, Ray Liotta's wife is smuggling like diamonds in her hair. I mean, there's all kind of smuggling going on, right? Well, a lady attempting to smuggle $450,000 worth of cocaine in her wheelchair. Now, There's pictures of it. 450K. I've always said this, and I've told my children this. Look, if you're going to rob something, go big. Don't rob a bank for 20 bucks. You know what I'm saying? Don't do that. Don't rob a bank for that. No. Do yourself a favor. If you're going to go to jail, go big time. You know what I mean? Go for something good. Go for something that, hey, look, you know, anybody can take 10 bucks. So this lady decided in her wheelchair, uh, yeah. All right, we got a little breaking news from the Combine. Uh, Ian Rappaport, a development for Jalen Carter, who has been here in Indy and is considered one of the top guys. Jalen Carter, listen to this, has been subject to an arrest warrant. Listen to this. In Athens, Georgia after being implicated by police for racing in the crash that took the life of the former player, Chandler McCoy. Man. No, not Chandler McCoy. Excuse me. Uh, I don't have the name. Remember the guy uh, and the gal that passed away right after the national championship? She was like a recruiting lady, and he was a player. Well, an investigation found Chandler McCoy, driver, and Jalen Carter, Carter, driver, uh, were operating their vehicles in a manner consistent with racing shortly after leaving downtown Athens. The evidence demonstrated both vehicles switched between lanes, drove in the center lane, drove in the opposite lanes of travel, overtook other motorists, drove at a high rates of speed, and a parent attempt to outdistance each other. Evidence showed that shortly before the crash, the expedition, which is what Carter was driving, was going 104 miles an hour. Toxicology reports indicate that McCroy's blood alcohol was 0.197. Investigators uh, determined that alcohol impairment, racing, reckless driving, and speed were significant factors to the crash. Arrest warrant issued for reckless driving and racing for who is the number one prospect in the NFL draft, that is Jalen Carter. Man, I've told you. And you saw it last night to a totally different degree. But it is impossible. It is really impossible to handle, for most kids, the fame that comes with winning. Like, you know, I knew there was something more to the staffer and the player that died, you knew there was something more. Like I I told you on this show, I guarantee you that there's something more. Devin Wilcox and Chandler LaCroix, yeah. Uh, Devin uh, Willock was the kid who died, right? And then there was a young lady, a staffer, driving a staff car. I told you, like, I've been in this too long, man. I've been in this way, way, way too long for anything like that to happen, and there's not a backstory. If you've watched our show, what's the one thing that we always tell you? And we will always tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there is always a backstory. There is always. Now, Senator BS asked, why wait until the combine? I don't have an answer to that. 
I honestly don't. I don't. I don't have an answer. Like, I don't know, did it take this long for the police investigation? Did it take this long to them to finalize? Did they wait until, I, I, I just don't know. But one thing I do know is this does not surprise me. It surprises me, you know, maybe that they were racing or whatever. But it does not surprise me that there's a backstory here. Nobody wanted to get into it. Everybody certainly was tippy-toeing around it. But why was a young staffer, a young woman, driving a car that didn't belong to her with players at 2 o'clock, 2.30 in the morning? Honest to God. That's the first thing I think all of us thought of, was it not? It's the first thing that entered my mind. I guarantee you, uh, the folks that are on the YouTube chat, I guarantee you it's the first thing that entered your mind going way back. And it's horrible. It's horrific. And again, I think of the victims. And I also think this, man, if you're Jalen Carter and you're all these guys, yeah, the arrest warrant is something, but isn't there something in your brain that makes you feel awful that you were involved in the death of somebody? Yeah, I get it. I'm wrong. I get it. I'm a bad guy. I get it. All that kind of stuff. But seriously, isn't there something in your brain that says, man, I I can't live with this. I got to seek therapy. I I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. I I cannot tell you. But man, oh man, arrest warrant for Jalen Carter out now. Uh, hey, Dylan, can you guys tweet that from OutKick with our show so people know that we're covering it because this just came out and it's horrible news for everybody. Like, I have no interest in young people that have everything going for them and then screw it up. I have no interest in making fun of them. It's tragic. It's tragic for everyone involved here. People want to, I'm sure will rip Jalen Carter. And he should, I guess, but I just can't. I can rip when it's involved in murder. I can rip that. But I just, man, dudes just throwing stuff away just makes me crazy. It does. Because Jalen Carter, let's be honest, I don't know where he's going to be drafted. I don't know these charges. Who knows? Guys have played. uh, Dante Stallworth played after hitting a guy in the middle of the night or early morning and killing him. He came back and played, right? Ray Lewis, the whole day, whatever. But I got to tell you, this is horrible. And I don't think I'm overstating it. I honestly don't. I do not think I'm overstating this. Sad, 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 sad news. And you know what? It's just like Georgia can't stop themselves. Like Georgia is just going to continue to have these problems. And I'm telling you, and I'll keep telling you, it is really difficult in this era to handle at 20 or 21 the fame that you get. Now, once you get in a situation, and this is my problem with Brandon Miller, once you get in a situation, my problem with Nate Oates, you got to show empathy, compassion, regret, remorse, be sorry, whatever. Man, bad, 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 bad news. Now, people are going to say, why at the combine? Who knows? Maybe they wanted the biggest splash possible. Maybe they did. Maybe they said, we want the biggest splash we can possibly get. And the combine is going on here, and Indy Carter is there. Let's make some news. Let's, I, or maybe they just finished what they were doing. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Brad Buffington. Anyway, we'll talk to Trey uh, uh, Trey Wallace. Trey is our SEC Alabama expert, uh, but this is this is this is not something that I celebrate. You know what I mean? Mm. Uh, Bill Polly says, "How bad do you want it? Who do you want to surround yourself with? Who's got your back? We've all made mistakes when we were young. Not all of us were getting ready to make it to the NFL. Very, 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 very." few of us. Uh, Iron Man says a lady tried suing me after I pulled it from a burning car. Her broken foot didn't take it well, and she got thrown out. Wow. All right. There you go. God, that's sad. All right. Uh, We'll take a break right now. We'll get Trey Wallace on, and we'll come and get, get some conversation to this when we come back. Man. 
As a pitcher, there's nothing I love more. There was nothing that I, I relished more than a one pitch out. That was a, that was like a gift from God as a, as a pitcher um, because I had this game plan. I got to get a hitter out. I got to work this count. I got to do these things. You give me a one pitch out, and, and then, you know, I didn't like to face guys like you for this reason. I don't want to have to use seven, eight, nine pitches to get an out. I, I don't I want and, – and, and, you know, that was the Tony Gwynn thing. You know, you had the strike zone, but you knew the strike zone. And so, you know, my, my forte – you show me a guy that strikes out 100 times, I can show you a guy I can get out pretty easily because he's got holes. You show me yeah. a guy that gets on base 40% of the time, and I got, I, I'm going to have a little bit of, uh, of a concern. And you mentioned something that, that I think f- tails into to, to the discussion we're going to have today. I worked quick, I, and, and so people have asked me about the pitch clock, and I said the pitch clock will never affect a pitcher that sucks because good, <laughs> pitchers, good pitchers work fast. And if you saw Scherzer yesterday, it was hilarious. He struck a guy out who was backing out of the batter's box. I mean, <laughs> but, but that's what we did. Tempo was part of my game. That was part yeah. of it's a weapon <laughs> and, and hitter and not being able to. And I, I'm wondering, because you were a guy that, that took time in the bats. You could make a 10 pitch at bat go a while. How are hitters going to have to adjust now? You can only get out of the box one time. You got to be in the, you know, I mean, the tempo is going to be a lot quicker, good or bad for hitters. A bad. I mean, look, look, I mean, you're talking to a guy. Okay. Remember. So, so when I let off the game on the road, okay. At that moment in time, I controlled everything. Right. So when we used to play Atlanta, okay, in, in, in Atlanta, I used to take a long, sweeping walk room and stop right in front of Ted Turner and Jane Fonda <laughs> and stare right into Jane Fonda's eyes. And I'd say some some things that you probably I shouldn't say on here, but every day it was tradition. And then people would be yelling, get in the box, get in the box. And I'd be like, you know, you know what I'd say. Yep. And like, I mean, you don't get voted the most hated player in the league five years in a row without doing these kind of things. Right. But I was voted the most hated player in the league five because I made the other job, other people's jobs hard. Yep. See, like I say, remember our team? Like, I see you talking to another team, the other teammate, we're fighting. Yeah. Like, well, this is, we're playing for real money here. Right. Like, and then the thing about it is, and that's why when, when, when you pitched, see, you were so prepared to get so serious, you carried out to the field too, don't forget. When you're out there in the field, you got a guy. Um, yeah, I don't want these people's names. You know, going, guy. guy going three two on everybody, and oh, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I get that, oh, and, and that was part part of that too, Lenny. I learned on that team from because it was a veteran team, and I was a younger guy. Listen, when we're playing in St. Louis and it's 165 degrees on the turf, I need to get my players off the field, and and so that became a, a, a you know because I wanted my I I was wanted, and as I got older and became more in charge of my defense, I always wanted guys invested in the day I pitched. You know, the news just hit Jalen Carter, the number one prospect by all accounts in the NFL draft, served an arrest warrant involving um, the crash that killed a staffer and a player at the University of Georgia speeding. I don't get the whole speeding thing in a city. Like, I get speeding. I speed on the highway, but I ain't drag racing 104 miles an hour just outside of downtown Athens. We go to our friend, thanks for joining us, Trey Wallace, who knows the SEC, Carter, the whole deal. Trey, I always said this, I, I, and nobody really wanted, and I didn't want to talk about it when it first happened, but I got to tell you, man, there's always a backstory. I, I coached long enough. I've been around my kids, everybody. There's always a backstory. When I heard the initial report of a staffer player, 2 o'clock in the morning, all of a sudden a car, I, there's always a backstory. Yeah, there is, Dan. And unfortunately, there's, you know, and, and, and the police are going to take their time to look into to this case and they're not going to rush to to put anything out just because, you know, it, it might suit 
the media it might suit us or you know it 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 uh, the the family in the situation i feel you know worse about i you know knowing that you know they they are probably up to date on everything that's going on this is probably not a surprise to the family um but this is just you know it 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 makes that night um even even worse and and, and i mean that in a sense of you look at all you put everything together that happened that night and 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 now you add on to the fact that they were you know allegedly according to the police they were speeding they were they were switching lanes they were going in the middle of the lane they were passing each other pretty much they were drag racing uh right outside out athens downtown where there's open area for it so dan i mean now you know and 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 this resulted in the loss of life um of two people and you know i i i do find it and i, I don't know how you feel about this so i'm, I'm just gonna kind of say it i find it interesting and it's just weird the timing is and i'm not saying athens police department goes out to get jalen carter by any stretch of the imagination or or anything like that man it's just Life comes at you at weird times because this kid was supposed to speak here in 10 minutes at the NFL combine and the arrest warrant is issued uh, today. It's just, you know, it's almost like this is a weird way of, of, of unfortunately, it's not unfortunate. I, I want to use my words correctly here, but this is just another part of the problem. That, that they all face that night that the university is facing that, you know, these, these, these young men that are up there, you know, Nolan Smith was, was breaking down in tears today at the NFL combine talking about his former teammate. And, and now this, you know, now this comes out, man, just a, just another layer to this story that uh, I don't think a lot of people were expecting. It probably was not that Nolan Smith has been served, but you, you know, people talk uh, that kind of thing. Here's my thing with it, Trey. I, I always look. I got this incredible guilt, like I have Catholic guilt, like no human being alive. Uh, and in fact, sometimes in the middle of the night, I delete tweets because I'm like, yeah, I shouldn't have said that. Yeah, that was bad. Yeah, you know, it just drives me nuts. I can't imagine yeah. going through this. And not feeling incredibly guilty is the same thing with the Brandon Miller deal. Like, I, you got to, at some point, you got to think about the victims and your role in what happened. I don't know the role of either. I don't. I know what I'm going to read, and I don't necessarily believe everything I read. But at some point, you got to think if you're involved in whatever, in whatever way, man, it's got to be crushing guilt on you. It's got to be. I, it, I've never been involved in something like that. But it's got to be something where you feel like the walls are kind of closing in on you, um, and yeah. and it and it's and it's to that point where you know what, uh, you know, I, I don't know how I feel. You know what I mean? That's that's got to be what the young man's going through uh, because his incident, his his alleged incident that night, was a cause in why there was a crash that took the lives of two people. Um, I think that, and I'm not, you know, I, I'm not going to sit here and, and, and talk about, okay, what does NFL future look like? I don't, I don't, whatever. I yeah. mean, that, that's not the point yeah, right whatever. now. The point, the, right. the point is, the point is, is that it's been, it's been two months, I guess, two and a half months since, since the incident happened. Um, and now Jalen Carter's name is being brought out, you know, into this and it shed light. And it's a, you know, it, here, here's what it is. It's a shock factor. You know what I mean? It's a shock factor for a lot of people around the country because most of the time, and I, and I will be, you know, admitted to this. I thought it was just a, a single car incident. You know what I mean? I thought it was a single car incident where they were just traveling down the road at a high rate of speed and maybe lost control. Now, this brings in a whole different light to the story. And, and even though they're misdemeanors and whatnot, 
there's going to be a lot to pay when it comes to Jalen Carter, when it comes to his future. And, you know, just even in his mindset, okay, that's one thing, living with it in your head. Um, but also down the road, I mean, there, there's going to be civil lawsuits. There's going to be, I mean, it, it's just going to go on and on. Oh, this is, yeah, this is going to be a mess, and this is not ending soon. Let me ask you, you're in Alabama. Yeah. Uh, Alabama fans are dying to let this thing go. I, here's my thing on yesterday's pronouncement by Nate Oates. I get it. Um, I said to Clay Travis yesterday, I go, look, yeah, I could see where he was, didn't know what all the little dance moves were. He, You know, you drew up what you want, the last thing, but – when he said yesterday that we all felt terrible about it, we talked about it, my question was, well, and because this is the way it goes as a head coach. Game's over. Every single team has a social media group. They have photographers. I was just talking about this with my friend uh, whose son is, is heads a team of Ohio State football, and what he said was, look, game's over. If something happens on social media, you're immediately, as a coach, told about it. You go do your media, you go do whatever, and basically it takes a half hour, and now you're back in front of your team. So my thing is this. If they addressed it then, before the kids left the locker room, and Nate Oates told everybody about, hey, this was the wrong thing to do, we all feel terrible, blah, 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 and, and then Brandon Miller went out and put it on his profile picture, everybody's full of crap here. And I know he deleted it, but if if Oates told them and they all agreed they felt terrible, you don't go put it on your social media profile. You see my timeline here, Trey? Yeah, I think it's a a a really really bad communication breakdown between the people at Alabama uh, and Brandon Miller and Nate Oates. And when I say that, Dan, you know how many people are working in a communications department and when it comes to photography, video, SIDs, right. you name it. I mean, there, you know, uh, it's upwards of 50 people that work in there. And I'm even talking about like assistants, you know what I mean? Like it, it just, so the fact that they haven't, or they didn't have that conversation, but Hey man, chill out. Like on this stuff, like stop, Stop poking the bear, I think is the best way to put it when it comes to potentially, you know, putting yourself in a bad situation. Not only is the country looking at you, you've got NBA folks looking at you as well. You're you're most likely going to be testifying in this case. Um, everything that you do, everything that you do is is now in the public eye when at first you were a really good basketball player on a on a team at Alabama, you know, that potentially had, you know, Final Four caliber, and you're going to go make millions in the NBA one day. That changed on that night in January. So everything you do now is in the spotlight. And I, th I just, again, I think that the communication side of Alabama has been very, very bad. And I say that in a terms of getting statements out, I say that in terms of, you know, letting Oates know what's going on, but then Nate Oates, you know, having a breakdown in communication and not getting the words out the way he's supposed to, you know, it's just, it's a lot, man. And, and, you know, and, and like taking folks behind the scenes that they don't know that are watching, like after a basketball game, and you're going to know this too, after a basketball game, before they go meet with the media, you leave the locker room. You're probably going to have like maybe a two to three minute conversation with your sports information director, the guy that calls out questions, and he's going to tell you, hey, man, uh, by the way, during the game, there was a lot of stuff that happened on social media. You're going to be asked about it. Hey, man, here's a good way you can answer it. Okay, well, you get up there and you, and you do your thing, and then all of a sudden, it's still a thing because it comes back and says, well, no, it's a part of a, a TSA pat down, whatever. And, and it's like, he's continuing to just build the story and he doesn't know how to just shut it off and say the right thing and just be, you know, like put, put closure on it from a standpoint of talking with the media. I think that's the problem that you're seeing 
right now with Nate Oates. And uh, this is not going away. I mean, I, I told this to somebody yesterday. Alabama's about to travel to Nashville for the SEC tournament next week that I'll be in attendance at. And you're going to have media members that have not been in Tuscaloosa that are going to ask questions that you're not going to be able to run away from. Um, and and I think it, it, it's getting outside of the Tuscaloosa bubble and having to answer these questions again, Dan, and you know that, you know, you go on the road to an NCAA tournament, you got media members from the West coast and, and Northeast, whatever. So I'm just saying like, this is not going away and it shouldn't go away in my opinion, just the whole situation. And, and, and I think that they better figure things out really quick or they're going to continue to look like fools. It, it is interesting, you know, um, because I, here, here's what happens. You go in a locker room, they throw water on you, and you're exactly right. Because I, I do believe that he had – because during the game, people were talking about it. And this is what drives me nuts. Like, during the game, people had to be talking about it. In fact, uh, I'm sure he went out, SID said, I don't know, can you remember that they asked questions after the game at the press conference about – what uh, they did, right? They they asked him he at didn't, the press conference immediately after the game. They didn't have a chance to ask questions because Nate Oates addressed it before the questions even started. Okay, so that's it. All that's right, an so let easy... me take you. Let me take you through this. Right. Hold on. Let me take you through this. Yeah. So Oates knows about it. He addresses it at the press conference at the game right after the game, right? Right? He, at the game, he addressed yeah. it? Yeah. Correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. So now, he knows about it. Yes. So now, if you have a half a brain, whatever players get showered, whatever, you come back to the locker room, and before you let the players go, you say, all right, practice is Tuesday. Stay by your phones. We'll text you. Whatever the story is, right? Make sure you go to class. Great win. Here's where we're at with practice. Here's where we're at with a tournament. That's when you tell your team, hey, look, what the hell happened here with this pat down? All right? That's how it goes. Here's where my problem is. So after that, Brandon Miller goes to his Twitter account because he did it after the game and changed the Twitter picture to the pat down. The next day or whatever, they delete the Twitter. So then Oates tells us yesterday how sorry everyone was. What do you mean you were sorry? The kid was probably 99% told this was bad. Oates is, and then went out and changed his Twitter profile. That's, in my opinion, Trey, if that's the scenario, that's sticking it to, in my opinion, the victims. That's telling you, hey, up yours to the victims. That's how I look at it, Trey. I think it is a, uh, if that's the timeline of how it went down, Dan, I think that is also uh, telling Nate Oates, hey, man, I, I don't I don't really care what you think. I'm going to do what I want to do. I think, th- I think, I think that's, I think that's, I think that's something else as well. Um, and I'm not going to sit here and, you know, discuss you know, the character debate. On Brandon Miller, because I've been told that, you know, right. by multiple people in Nashville that he, hey, that's a good kid. He came up good, you know, good parents, whatnot. But yeah, also, also, it is kind of interesting how, you know, it, it feels like at times, and this is just a feeling, it's feeling like he's like defying certain things that are going on. And not to say he does not have remorse. I am not saying that at all. I'm saying that he's a young kid with a lot of power right now. And I'm just curious to see, I'm, I'm curious to know his mindset. Like I, I would, I would, I would love to know after the season or whenever, when he sits down with somebody, some of the questions that are going to be asked and how he tries to answer them. I, I just, you know, it is, uh, it's been a weird situation. It really has a tragic, weird situation. Alabama hasn't done themselves any favors and Brandon Miller sure hasn't either. No, I'm, I, I, I don't, you know, I, I'll give them credit because it's hard to win when everything is going smoothly, you know, in yeah. one direction. And they've managed, 
you know, they've managed to win. So if that's the goal to win, they've done their job. They've, they've continued on a course. Now, whether they can sustain it, you mentioned it. You know, when you go to Knoxville or no, I'm sorry, Nashville and you're going to the tournament, all of a sudden you're right. Hey, look, whoever Alabama is going to be playing, that media wants to ask him the mindset of the team, right? Given what Brandon Miller is. That, that's, that's others. You're right. National media will be there, you know, with questions. So I think you're absolutely right. I, do you think – here's a, another of my theories, Trey. I think that uh, Oates is playing the long game here. He's like, hey, I had a murder, horrendous situation. Three of my players are involved. Every coach thinks about recruiting. So what they're going to say is, hey, look, I'm standing by my players. I stand by my players. If they're wrong, I discipline them. If they're right, I don't care – the public opinion, I stand by him. That's kind of what I see Oates doing here, playing a little bit of a long game for recruiting. Maybe I'm wrong. You know, I was having this conversation with somebody yesterday, and this was brought up to me. You know, you there's a coach over there who's probably really pissed off right now with how this has gone down, and his name is Nick Saban. Okay? Nick Saban has a pretty strict policy when it comes to off the field stuff. I, I know the stories in the past and I get that, you know, but if a player misses class, if a player is not, you know, going to school, if he's acting up, you know, he's not going to play, uh, you know, there's a lot of quiet suspensions that folks do not hear about at Alabama. So what happens? Okay. What happens if something, let's just say in the spring or in the fall during football season, happens with one of his players and it's not big Dan it's like a uh you know the kid missed curfew for a couple nights or the kid wasn't going to classes for a couple days you know what we're benching him what does that say about Nate Oates that if Nick Saban has to suspend a kid for something really small because it doesn't fit with his program that Nate Oates can't put a kid down for two days, sit him down for two two games to try to teach him a lesson. I've been, you know, I, I just I'm just putting it out there that it, you know, Nick Saban runs his way. I guess Nate Oates runs his program his way. But what I'm getting at is that there's going to come a point where whether we like it or not, something's going to happen in Tuscaloosa with the football team, and we're going to have to we're going to have to look at it, correlate it. Okay, well that. That didn't make sense for the football program. Why the basketball program not do it? Like, I'm just saying, like, there's, there's going to be optics that come out of that university over the next year that are going to bring this back up to light again. Hey, what are you working on? What's going on? Yeah, man, working on a, uh, working on a piece right now about, uh, you know, college coaches getting out of the, 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 the college football game and, uh, and getting into the NFL kind of burn out with what's going on with the portal and, NIL and, and, re, and recruiting, you know, it's, it's just a different day and age right now, Dan. And, uh, you got a lot of coaches that, you know, um, are not wanting to, to deal with the college stuff right now and how much it's changed over the last three years. And so hopefully, uh, yeah, have something maybe about that this afternoon or, or tomorrow. And you can catch the podcast tonight. Uh, gonna have, uh, Jason Brown, coach Jason Brown from last chance you. Uh, he came on a lot of discussion, you know, about what's going on in college football these days. And, uh, you know, we talk a little Nate Oates as well and whatnot. So should be a fun conversation that'll drop tonight. And, uh, other than that, man, we're just grinding away here at Outkick. I guarantee you it's a fun conversation because the coach, and he's got no walls, baby. He's ready to rock and roll. Uh, appreciate you, my friend. Thanks for coming on. Have a great day, buddy. Appreciate you, Dan. Yeah, man. That's our friend Trey Wallace. Follow his podcast. You can catch it on Outkick. Trey Wallace. And I'm going to tell you right now, I don't know whether my timeline is right or not, but if it is, Trey made a great point, and he said if the kid did that with his profile picture after he was told by Nate Oates, then, man, what are we do? who's running the ship here? It's hard now because this kid doesn't need Nate Oates. This kid doesn't need Alabama, Brandon Miller. This kid's going to the NBA, and he's going to make a ton of money. And I am of the camp that this kid is a guy that is looking better and better to NBA scouts. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just telling you to lay the land. 
because of how he has played under this scrutiny. It's a little bit, truthfully, it's a little bit like it was like Cam Newton, right? Remember when Cam Newton's dad was accused of soliciting offers for Cam and he ends up at Auburn after getting kicked out of Florida and next thing you know, he's winning a national championship going undefeated and every time he turns around, there's two cameras in his face going, wait a sec. So, you know what? It is a fascinating, fascinating deal. All right, a couple things to look for tonight. Antoine Davis, I told you, 26 points, and he sets the all-time NCAA scoring record, passing every Serbian's idol, the great pistol Pete Maravich, who set the record, playing for his dad, Press, by the way, in 1970. And if you don't know, you're going to know, because Antoine Davis plays for his dad right now at the University of Detroit, and Detroit got the win. So there you go. Ladies and gentlemen, college basketball is heating up. Tomorrow, you're going to hear about the Redbirds because Illinois State, baby, starts their march towards the NCAA tournament. Yeah, that's right. I said it. I meant it. I ain't going to forget it. They start their march towards the NCAA tournament. Tonight, we got, let's see, Auburn at Alabama. Now, remember, this game's going to be sexy. It's at 7 o'clock, ESPN2 has it. Here's why this game is going to be sexy. Auburn's coach, Nate Oates, talks some smack. Or excuse me, Alabama's coach, Nate Oates, talks some smack after they went into Auburn and beat Auburn. Well, it's their Super Bowl, all kind of stupid stuff. Maryland fighting for an NCAA bid. I got to believe they are in. They're 20 and 9. They play at Ohio State. Ohio State coming off a pretty Pretty, pretty, pretty good win. And then, of course, Texas and TCU. Man, let me look at this. So Texas is number nine. TCU is 22. There's a kid named Miles that plays for TCU that is really, really, really good. He was hurt. Now he's healthy. And when he's healthy, TCU can ball. All right. Who's our woke adult before I have to go potty? What do you got here? Yeah, yeah, this whole teacher thing and pronouns, let me address that for a second. Um, My daughter teaches school, and she doesn't ever get into that. I have friends that other places that teach school, and in in New Pal, they punish teachers because, well, actually, they embarrass kids because they said, hey, look, you need to give me your pronouns. And the kid said, I'm Daniel. And the teacher made a big deal about it. No, you're being disrespectful. So a friend of mine is going to go in front of the school board at New Palestine and say, why are we doing this? New Palestine is a really good town right over here, a little bit. I'm pointing like you know where I'm at, right? A little bit south of me on the west side of Indianapolis. But they did that. They said, why do we have to even engage students, high school students, in pronouns? If somebody asked me my pronoun... I would say, leave me alone. I say, ah, Dan. No, what's your pronoun? Dan. What's your, what? Dockage. Yeah, mispronouning somebody. Kiss my backside. If a kid goes to high school and their name is Jimmy or Jeffy or Joey or Jolene or Jeremy, I don't care. Why do they got to give a pronoun? So this teacher forced a girl to use male pronouns and then a nine-year-old is like, who am I? What am I doing? Look, being a kid is hard enough. Hell, being an adult's hard enough. We don't need to confuse. And again, I go to this. Why are teachers so freaking into, or why are schools, or why are our public so into doing anything with children other than letting them be children? Why does a nine-year-old have to discuss pronouns? Why does a nine-year-old have to have drag queens in front of their face. Why all of this? Can somebody please tell me? I'm willing to listen. Why can children not be children? If I went to class as a nine-year-old, well, man, second or third grade, and a teacher said, well, what's your pronoun? Uh, 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 your, the, it, the, uh, I don't know, run. No, that's a verb. Wait a second. I mean, can you freaking imagine having to answer to that 
as a nine-year-old? Are you insane? But yet, here we are. Here we are. You want to know why suicide rates are high? I'm going to tell you why suicide rates are high. Because number one, we don't allow kids to fail. We coddle kids. They don't learn how to fail. Fail is this horrible thing because they turn on social media and they see another person doing better than them their same age. And it drives them nuts. And they become a failure in their own mind. They don't know that that person is just a little more clever using social media. They don't know that. They just know that that lifestyle is better than mine and we're the same age and I'm not getting it done. Second thing, mental health in this country stinks. I've told this story many times. I had a former player. Uh, He transferred after, on the day of the anniversary of his father's suicide. When his father committed suicide, I had to tell him, we drove to Huntington where he was from. I brought the whole team in for the funeral. But a year later, He transferred, got hooked on Oxycontin. Next thing you know, I hadn't heard from him in a year. His mother calls me and says, I need your help. We moved the kid into my house. My then wife took him to various meetings, took him to uh, Alcoholic Anonymous. He wasn't an alcoholic, so they found the drug uh, treatments. They found all kinds of different things, and she wanted to get him mental health. Couldn't find it. Wasn't really available. Kind of a joke. We don't help people. We hurt people. If you tell me that a girl nine years old is forced to describe her pronouns is helping that girl, that's crap. You know what that's doing? That's pushing an agenda of a teacher that should not be with kids because as a teacher, you're supposed to, again, help, not hinder, not detract. I used to tell my wife this when I was trying to woo her away from a very handsome firefighter in New Jersey. Hey, man. I'm just trying to be part of the solution, not the problem. So I'll let you go. Of course, she came back. You got to try to be part of the freaking solution, not the problem. I agree. I agree, Iron Man. Chemical depression, clinical depression is horrible. I had it. I've told the story many times. I take Lexapro every day. Uh, I slept on the floor because if I slept in a bed, I couldn't get my head off the pillow. I had to be uncomfortable. Literally, think about this, sleeping on the floor, rolling over. Hell, it was because we were losing. And you look back on it, you're like, is it really that big a deal? Of course it is to you. It's your job. It is awful. Dan, why are you so obsessed with drag queens? Seems like a personal problem, to be honest. Rick, let me ask you a question, Rick. Everybody should be concerned about drag queens. Everybody should be concerned about the mentality that takes and becomes sexually explicit in front of young children. And if you're not, I would ask you, what's your deal with young children? Why is it okay for an adult to wake up and say, you know what, as I saw and showed yesterday, hey, look, I'm going to dress up in a sexually explicit way and go dance in a sexually explicit way of children, Rick. If you don't understand that, kiss my backside. You're an idiot, might be a pedophile. If you don't understand what I'm saying, I'm sorry you're that stupid. I'm sorry you're that demented. Maybe God made you that way to get help and change your ways. I'm not sure. But honest to God, who wouldn't be concerned about a guy that wakes up, says, I'm going to dress in drag and I'm going to twerk in front of children? Now, what kind of mentality is that, Rick? What is wrong with you? What is wrong with that? And the world is full of Ricks. Well, what's wrong with it? They have rights. I just say, great, you got rights. Go twerk. Go get yourself a bunch of 20-year-olds and go twerk. I don't care, but why are you doing it to children? What is in your brain, your DNA, that makes you want to do that to children? Teach them how to tuck a buck. Really? They need to learn how to do that? They need to learn that boobies are flying and things are going. No, it's stupid. So, Rick, if you're that stupid, I'm sorry. I'm not saying you're a pedophile. I'm saying what is in your DNA, Rick, where you are sitting here defending it. What is in your DNA? What is it? It's unbelievable. It is. Well, you seem to have a personal problem. Yeah, I do. I don't want children to be anything but children. 
That's it. That's it. I don't need them with pronouns. I don't need them with rainbow flags. I don't need them talking and watching sexual freaking perverts uh, that wake up and say, I'm going to dance in front of kids. I don't need that. They should be riding bikes. They should be learning how to read, write, spell, the whole deal. They should be learning and doing things that children do. You want to know why suicide rates are up? Guys like Rick. We used to call it evil. That's right, Jim. We used to call it evil and purge weirdos out of our society if they threatened our kids. Now we got guys like Rick or whatever the hell his name is saying, well, it seems like a personal problem. Yes, it's a personal problem. Let kids be kids, jackass. Don't at me. It's a great show today. It's a great show today. It really is. Parents should have the right to decide if and when their kids would ever be around. No, they shouldn't. Just maybe they should. This other guy. Maybe. But I got to tell you, what kind of human being wakes up and says, I'm going to dress in drag. I'm going to go to the kindergarten. And I'm going to dance around. Good for you, man. Good for you. Boogeyman politics. Yeah, good. Uh, Who's going to fight Zelensky? Not me. 93, Ukraine forever, 7. I don't know what that means. But it's in the warped mind of Dylan and Ryan, so I love it. I don't like it. I love it. Anything that comes out of the warped mind of those two, I am all in on. And I would include Haley in that. Aaron. Gary, Caitlin, our whole crew, Chuck, Davey, we got a great crew. All right. I, I just don't get the world. I, I, yeah, of course it's personal. Of course it's personal to keep a freaking drag queen out of kindergartens. Think about this. Think about having to say that phrase. Of course, it's personal to keep a drag queen out of kindergarten. I'll be back tomorrow. Holy crap. See you.